My name is Gary Kaplan. I'm the medical director of the Kaplan Center for Integrative Medicine in McLean, Virginia. Uh, we've the, we are the oldest integrative medical center in the Washington, D.C. area. We've been uh, in practice for over uh, 25 years. And we're a team of physicians, physical therapists, nutritionists, nurse practitioners, nurses, uh, and therapists, both in uh, psychotherapy and in nutrition, uh, devoted to helping people with chronic pain and chronic illness. Over the years, we've noticed uh, an association between chronic pain and depression and uh, anxiety disorders, and also post-traumatic stress syndrome. And indeed, by our estimates, about 20% of our patient population suffers with both uh, post-traumatic stress disorders and chronic pain, and about 60% of our population has comorbid uh, psychiatric issues in addition to their chronic pain problems. We've been studying this problem for a number of years, and as part of that study, we organized a group of psychiatrists, a uh, neurophysiologist uh, out of Georgetown, and uh, people who are experts in meditation. And uh, we have been looking at, for the last three to four years, trying to understand why this, these diseases frequently co-occur and why they're so much tougher to treat. As a consequence of that, uh, our studies have taken us to, given us a great deal of insight into the neurophysiology of both of these conditions and given us a rather unique perspective on how to go about treating these conditions. And so today's lecture is going to be about essentially the neurophysiology of both chronic pain and depression. All right, so we'll start off with a series of questions that you guys get to answer to begin with. So, uh, approximately what percentage of people suffering with depression will have a comorbid psychiatric disorder? The answers are A, B, C, and D. Which do you choose? Go about. David. Lisa. Suzanne. Okay. The prevalence of depression, the presence of depression in someone suffering with chronic pain is predictive of a poor outcome, true or false? Show of hands, true. Show of hands, false. And none of the above. Shame it. Huh? Which of, which of these can cause activation of central nervous system microglia? Infectious diseases, post-traumatic stress syndrome, heavy metals, traumatic brain injury, or all of the above? David. Good man. Microglia phenotypes include, and we'll discuss what phenotypes are, uh, ramified states, activated uh, amoeboid states, uh, macrophage, or all of the above. Okay, so let's start off with what is a major depressive disorder, and let's uh, start off with uh, what chronic pain is. All right, so major depressive disorders, in these individuals, you see depressed mood, loss of energy, difficulty with concentration, short-term memory problems, executive functioning problems, organizing their day, being able to foresee a future and plan out a, a day and what needs to be happening. They have problems with appetite disturbances. You can have excessive eating. You can have uh, loss of appetite. Uh, you can have psychomotor agitations and retardations. So that means that people can become somewhat hyperactive or they can become somewhat catatonic and very severely withdrawn. Uh, we also see problems with sleep disturbances, either sleeping too much or sleeping too little. This is not the classic definition in terms, the, the medical definition in terms of depression, this is rather what you see clinically in terms of people who are depressed. Remember that major depressive disorder is a medical diagnosis, is one that has very significant impacts on people's uh, lives in terms of their social functioning, uh, their uh, occupational functioning, their ability to take care of themselves and take care of and interact with others. The reason I'm sticking to this particular definition, and this is the external expressions of the disease, is because there's a lot of overlap with what happens with chronic pain. And thus, it starts us thinking about that there may also be a lot of overlap with the neurophysiology of these diseases. Chronic pain, on the other hand, is a condition that persists beyond an expected course of recovery. So if you injure your hand, say you hit it with a hammer, we expect that within six weeks' time, the pain will completely resolve and you'll uh, be back to normal. If it's extending past that period for three months, then perhaps there's something else going on and we need to look into it. Pain associated with a chronic pathologic process that causes continuous problems or the pain reoccurs in intervals from months to years. So chronic pa pathologic process would be cancer as an example, uh, where you have ongoing tissue destruction and ongoing reason for having pain. Uh, but there's other situations where the pain comes and goes and we're not at all certain why that is. 
frequently there's an affective component to that. What that means is that there's frequently anxiety associated with it. There can be uh, depression associated with it. Now, that depression that we're talking about may be just the depression of situational. I can't do what I used to do because I'm in pain. Okay, I can't do the job I used to do because I'm in pain. My back is such that I can no longer do the construction work that I used to be able to do. Uh, the disability from the disc disease in my neck uh, and the loss of use of my right arm make it impossible for me to continue working at the computer uh, and being able to uh, do the work that I used to do in the office. Uh, all of these things become distractions in terms of your ability to participate fully in life and do the sports that you used to love to do uh, or interact with your loved ones in a way that you want to. You can't play with your kids because you're in pain because you can't get up, you can't run after them. So uh, pain has very significant uh, uh, impacts on people's lives. It affects their appetite, it affects their sleep, it affects their mood. All right, and then the medications that we use can have impacts on these areas as well. Now, the thing that you also need to understand about chronic pain is until about five years ago, we had actually no idea what chronic pain was, per se, from at least a neurophysiologic standpoint. So the original model of pain was a telegraph line. So what happens is you hit your hand, and uh, the signal comes in, and the uh, message goes up to the brain, and there's some reaction that occurs, either a behavioral modification of what's going on or uh, a distraction talking about distractions, <laughs> a behavioral modification of, uh, of what you've been doing uh, in order that is a withdrawal response. So you put your hand on a hot stove, you move away, okay? And there's also learning that goes on in the process of that. That's a hot stove. I don't think I'm going to touch that again. So there's a complex behavioral change that happens with the experience of pain. Now, what happens in a situation with chronic pain is you stay in pain. Now, why does that happen? All right, so the next model of pain was you have pain, but there are periods of time when you can ignore the pain. So there was this concept of gating that occurred. This came out of the observations where we saw soldiers, for instance, on the battlefield who had fairly significant wounds, and yet they continued to fight and didn't complain of pain or even notice the fact that they had been severely wounded. Uh, hours later, when the fighting was down, when their need for survival was no longer attended to continuing in the battle, then the pain would start and the disability associated with the wound would also occur at that time. So why was that able to happen? And we started in with this concept of this gate theory and Melzek and Wall demonstrated that at the spinal cord level we were capable of gating, that is ignoring or allowing the, the signal of pain to come into the nervous system. And then there was further discovery that there were down uh, regulating pathways in the central nervous system that could allow us to modulate the incoming signal of pain. That is, we could either experience in its full uh, expression of what was coming in uh, from the damage to the outside, or we could stop it. All of that is about acute pain. It wasn't about chronic pain, though it was about chronic pain in the sense that by being able to have some downward regulation on the pain signal, we could gain some control as to whether or not we were experiencing an ongoing pain signal. So meditative techniques, relaxation techniques uh, became useful in terms of being able to help people modify and regulate their pain without the use of certain medications. Doesn't talk about why people stay in pain. So what happens? So now what happens is we've got people who have had damage. The damage is stopped. There's no longer tissue destruction going on. There's no longer an inflammatory process going on, and yet pain continues. And what this lecture is about is why that pain continues.